Hi, welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. My guest today, very talented jazz singer, Jonathan Courant. How you doing, Jonathan? I'm doing fine. Yeah, how you been holding up in these uh, apocalyptic times, my friend? Uh, Staying busy? I have stayed busy with some different things. It's uh, There have been some lights out of darkness, so to speak, but it's definitely uh, a big change in, in the world for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen you've been able to actually uh, do a couple shows here and there, like at the Tuscany, and uh, we've been watching you on your uh, online streaming pod, or uh, your shows online streaming. Those have been fantastic. Those were a lot of fun. Uh, when this all started, I started doing uh, shows on stage at, and they were good. The reaction was great to see people from Chicago to Singapore to. Italy to California, New York, wherever they might be to, to tune in. So it gave me a chance to connect with people that I maybe only see, you know, once a year when I travel to wherever they are. But um, those started to taper off. The numbers started to taper off uh, as people started to accept a new normal, I guess, or maybe get out more. Um, so I haven't really done many of those lately. But, yeah, I have been at the Tuscany a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal that Tuscany's been able to uh, continue to put on shows even with all this going on. Uh, they've been pretty good about like just doing tables, I think, is what's going on over at the Tuscany. Right. right. i, I got to give them kudos. I think they were the first in Las Vegas to have live music again. And um, the first night I was back there, the audience felt like they were at a reunion. I think they were just so grateful to have an experience that was live. Um, and they took out all the bar, ta bar seating and they, you know, asked that you come in, sit down and stay at your seat pretty much. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic, man. I, uh, I've been seeing a few here and there, like little shows where people are able to put a PA up and have some live entertainment at their events outside. Uh, but yeah, the Tuscany has been actually able to do it. Some of my rock friends have been able to go over there and put on their shows as well. Nice. So that's pretty fantastic, man. Uh, and yeah, you got this, uh, you got a new single coming out, right? You did a Etta James song? Yes, I, I, um, that's a song I've sung live a lot. And uh, a, a sweet fan and friend um, decided she wanted to fund that project. Uh, and uh, she requested that I record it. And I did that and it came out real nice. It's got Patrick Hogan on the B3 and the piano, and Nick Schmidt on bass, and Jeremy Kwaliki on drums. Nice. Is that your? Uh, is that the band you play with live, or is that a different band that you take into the studio? I like to switch it up a lot. That was actually my first time recording here in Las Vegas. I usually go to L.A. to record, um, but there are a lot of guys here I like playing with, and those are three of them. Um, Patrick's a great pianist, and uh, he's still at at UNLV, and I recorded it here uh, at Studio A Las Vegas. So Studio A Las Vegas? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I think I got a uh, little sample of it, too, uh, off of your website, jonathancurrant.com. Yeah. Something deep down in my soul said cry, oh, that's cry. Nice. When I saw you and that boy walking down And I would rather I would rather go blind I love Etta James, man. Yeah, You're a great version of that. Me too. Uh, and she um, has so many great ones. I think she actually helped write that one, which she didn't write a whole lot of songs in her career. But um, yeah... We gave more of like a kind of a soul jazz take on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds fantastic, man. Uh, and that's also available on uh, everywhere you can get music. I think uh, Amazon Music, iTunes, you can get that on Spotify as well. Right, yeah. Nice. Wherever you get your music these days. <laughs> no more physical music, of course. No, but I did uh, about two, Two weeks ago, I think, uh, Downbeat Magazine came out with an article saying that vinyl had surpassed CD sales for the first time in 30 years. Yeah, that's that's the only physical media we really listen to anymore is uh, is playing vinyls. We love it. It's really nice to, like, experience, uh, you know, being, like, 
there listening to your music as opposed to just like telling Alexa or something to play something. It's, right. Maybe it like, makes you appreciate it more to have to stop and go flip the record. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you get a few songs in and then you got to be active again. You, know, you can't just leave that shit running. Right. So. I mean, I have had a vinyl collection for years and it and it's grown and then it's I've let things go and then it's grown again uh, before it was hip. But uh, I still do listen to a lot of stuff digitally and and it sometimes it is is easier. It's 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 gotten interesting like as an artist like for live shows which we're not doing as many right now but they'll get back uh like for merch you know you don't ha you know with out selling cds it's kind of like well what do you uh what do you have there for people to take home cuz i do think people still like to feel like they take something home even just for like a, a memory of the the event or something like that I mean, I sold a lot of the CDs on my last album that dropped, but a lot of people had already downloaded it and said that they just wanted to take that home for like a keepsake or they wanted it signed. So I don't know what I'll do with the next one. For radio, actual radio um, promos, you still have to print CDs and send those out, although radio is also changing too, I mean. Yeah. So... It'll be interesting to see what happens with with all that. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of an evolving market that's been going on, man. I've really been interested in uh, doing the next thing, uh, my next project on vinyl for sure, uh, as opposed to just printing a bunch of discs. Because I always end up with a box full of discs I can't sell because everyone wants to just buy it. They just download it to their phone, and right. then I got shit tons of CDs sitting in storage that are just worthless at this point. You know that I invested in, and. Uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely different, man. I remember growing up, we we were all about that and and just pushing the CDs and and having them have them reprinted all the time. And and now it's more like I get one one printing done, and it's it's more for close friends and family that kind of want a physical thing, or like you're saying, or you know, they're at the show and they want to come give a little support and buy something from you more than right. You know, they're really they're gonna listen to it on their phone. Right. I. Uh I have some CDs, but the only, I got rid of all my CDs. But the ones that I kept are the ones that were signed by the artist, and I, I've, you know, maybe got like twenty. But I, I really w went down on my uh, CD collection. But I had already uploaded all that to my iTunes and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. But with vinyl, they now a lot of the times when you order it, they'll put like a card inside the vinyl with a digital like code to where you can also download it. Yeah, that's definitely the way to do it. Yeah, because then if a if a fan just wants to take that home and frame it or stick it in their bookshelf, then they do have something that's signed and physical like a memento or, you know, they can take that card out and uh and download the the digital stuff. Nice. So uh, what do you got planned for the, uh, the future, man? I know I think you have a show coming up at the, uh, the Tuscany, but uh, you've been hearing any other word? Uh, I know you used to play at the Red Rock a lot. And they, the Red Rock Casino, I think all station casinos canceled all live entertainment for the year. Oh, okay. So I might be back there after the new year. I'm not sure. Tuscany, I've been playing there about once a month. Uh, it's usually the third Saturday of the month. For now, we'll see what happens uh, in the new year. I've done a couple house parties, small house parties, like under 20 people, uh, where people have cocktails for like a half hour, and then they sit down, and I give like a house concert. So those have been nice. And um, again, the people that are there are always very like ecstatic to be, you know, <laughs> having a live experience. So hopefully when this is behind us and it's safe to to come out again, people will come out, um, you know, and thrive and, and rejoice in the fact that they can be out doing things like that. Maybe they'll feel like all those small things they took for granted, they really want to get back to. Yeah. Hopefully people won't get stuck on their couches forever. <laughs> I'm like, well, I can watch it on TV or, you know, that kind of thing. Hopefully this isn't creating, like, people to hermit more. Yeah, I know a lot of production companies that were really just gearing up to just go full live streaming and, and investing a lot into just like trying to figure out some kind of live streaming network or situation where they just have a, a huge 
stage just to produce online shows, but I haven't seen anybody actually make real money off of that, you know, besides some of the Live Nation events that I've seen where they're able to sell some real tickets to the events. And it's like, uh, yeah, I don't think that I don't think that'll end up being uh, really a, a a staple in the industry. I think it'll fade off pretty hard. Right. Well, I mean, people that frequent live music, there is such a different like kismet, or you feel the energy in the room, you feel the buzz of the audience. You, it's just a completely different experience than you know staring at it at your uh, device. You know. Also, you know when you're saying that those industries haven't been able to make money. You could have like 10 people that pay one entry fee if they're sitting at home, you know? So yeah, it's difficult, but the same is with, you know, music now. I mean, you can put out an album or a single and uh, nobody really has to download it or, or, or pay for it. And if they're listening on Spotify, you don't even make, like a cent per play it's like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny that you make so oh yeah i actually am on itunes of course uh but i don't have a subscription to apple music i i still feel the need that if there's a song i really like i want to purchase it and own it and know that it's like in my library forever i might make a playlist on spotify just out of the convenience of it. But if there's something that I really want, I um, I purchase it and download it and have it, you know. So if the prescription goes away or there's a new fangled way in, you know, five years, then I'll still have that music or won't forget about it or something like that. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. Like, uh, what is it? Primus is one of my favorite bands. And anytime Les Claypool releases anything, I always pay right away like the day it comes out which is fantastic i don't even have to go to the store anymore you know you just pull up itunes and download the record uh day of and then you have it forever on your phone or whatever device you have and you can support the artist directly that way but um now i know i remember um we were pushing albums with uh my last band cracker man and we were having a hard time really even making that much money off of it through the itunes thing compared to how we would normally have seen all of our profits through uh hard copy sales right uh i don't know it's 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 definitely a lot more of a i don't know it's a lot more difficult to to see the actual profits on the back end whenever you're just going through these digital media outlets definitely and yeah like you're saying spotify like we don't see any money from spotify ever it's just (laughs) like what are you gonna get when i uh, if i get like my whatever i however how often i get some residuals um sometimes i'll take the time to look at the breakdown and it's like you know 0.0 you know the the money that spotify pays and then when a fan will will say when i'll say hey you know did did you download my new song or something oh i'll just listen to it on spotify it's always like a stab (laughs) in the side like oh okay all right i love you anyway just listen to as long as you're listening to it (laughs) yeah it's hard man it's uh and without being able to perform live and to supplement like it's like now as a musician you're just really screwed because uh you're not going to make that much money on album sales because album sales have just depleted pretty much even when the pandemic wasn't going on it was like album sales really weren't where the money is totally it was always about getting paid for performing live and how much merch we could sell at the show Mm -hmm. and now you can't do any of that and you're just, and then, like you were saying, you know, Spotify is just going to stream it anyway. So, why pay for the album? It's it's really rough, right? And record labels don't seem to uh, support you the way they used to, unless you're like a big time commercial product. But um, yeah, it's it's a lot of the times hard to find the funds to put together an album because I do still think it's important to to release music, to stay relevant, to document where you are, um, and to, to feed feed your audience. I mean, if, if they can't always make it out, then at least they can put you on at home and pour a glass of wine or, or whatever their jam is. Yeah, man. It is, uh, it is interesting. I have, uh, I got another thing of you performing here. I think I have this sample video from your Facebook here on, uh, oh, bam. 
this boy has known. We used to love going to seeing you over at the Red Rock. You had such an eclectic crowd at the Red Rock. Yeah. I think I saw Wee Man show up to see you at the Red Rock. Yeah, he he's did. a big fan of yours too, yeah. right? Yeah, he's come a few times. That shit's cool. He's like hanging out with his with his mom, I think, right? Yes. And they were both fans of you living yeah. out here in Vegas. And that's such a fantastic venue. Yeah, it's like a small showroom, which I think uh, before everything hit, I think more of those smaller uh, rooms were really um, coming back. Yeah, we really enjoyed coming out and seeing you at the smaller shows, man. And it's free to walk in and enjoy live entertainment. Right. It's a great way to spend the evening. Yeah, that's one great thing that the casinos here can offer. Yeah, I really hope it starts coming back soon, man. Like you're saying, all my all my shows got canceled too. Like all the way out to the end of the year, I just got hit up about my New Year's Eve gig getting shut down. That was like my last, my uh, last hope, right? It was like, right. oh, at least I'll still have New Year's, I hope. But right. that's just gone, man. So uh, what you been up to anyways to like entertain yourself? You're saying you're going to the pool and, and hanging out and doing some fun stuff like that? Yeah, summertime in Vegas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of day drinking at the pool, <laughs> which I can't complain about because I, I love lying in the sun and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> or doing anything social with friends. I mean, uh, yeah, the, my favorite things are probably to make music, uh, practice yoga, and socialize. Oh, nice. Yeah. I just did my yoga today today, actually. I do my uh, P90X yoga every every Thursday, and it's been, you know, it's a lot of fun, a lot of hard work. We're trying to actually put together yoga videos for our YouTube channel as well. We want to start producing those. And putting them out, everyone's always talking about needing something to stretch to, and they don't know what they're doing. You know, they just want to, but they'd like to get into it. Right. What do you do for your yoga? Well, I was going to True Fusion a lot here okay. in, here in Vegas, um, and it's the classes that I was most attracted to uh, were the hot ones because I love the sweat that you get with that. Uh, I mean, I literally look like I've just stepped out of the swimming pool when <laughs> I leave the classroom, so. That always felt amazing to be that detoxed. Not you know your body, your your skin, just everything was left on the mat, which was great. Um, but now lately, I've been doing my own exercises at home, and it's been so beautiful lately that I've been going on walks um, a lot. I'm not a big runner because I think it's kind of hard on your knees, but. Yeah. Um, been doing some power walking around the neighborhood, yeah. looking at the mountains. Um, so that's been kind of beautiful and, uh, I love the heat here anyway, the dry heat. I, uh, being from Arkansas, um, the dry heat is, you know, amazing. Yeah. The humidity out in Arkansas is pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're going back there in a few weeks. Yeah. Going to go see some family out in Arkansas and, uh, enjoy the trees and the fall weather, like the actual weather. Right. It's going to be nice. There's I was just there. It's it's beautiful uh, this time of year. Oh, yeah. What were you doing up in Arkansas? I was uh, just visiting family, and um, they had a real wet summer, so th I think that guarantees for a beautiful fall, they say, so there should be a lot of colors this year. Nice. I'm sure that the mosquitoes were super high with that kind of rain that they'd had, but um, yeah, the humidity here, unlike a, a normal day, is like maybe... Uh, five percent i think and on a regular day there it's like you know 80 <laughs> percent so you definitely 85 feels kind of gross there and 85 here you might need a jacket <laughs> yeah yeah it feels cold outside after uh, 120 degree weather all summer long you know right. it's in the 80s it's just like oh man it's a nice brisk walk right but yeah, that's, uh, I've only been up to Arkansas the one time, uh, went for like a week or so when we were up there and it was beautiful though. Yeah, it, really it is beautiful. beautiful and it's very green and lush and, and, um, so there is that, I mean, seriously, it's, it's really beautiful to go hiking there or sit out somewhere on a porch and just look at all the lush greenery around you. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a meteor shower that's going to be happening that we'll be filming. Uh, and we got a great cabin to stay at, so that should be fun, man. We'll Fantastic. Probably be, probably be posting that online as well, Yeah. some of the meteor shower stuff. I think Mars 
I don't think, I know, yeah. is the closest to Earth right now, that it, and it won't be this close again for like 35 years? Yeah, I was just looking at I got the, um, what's it called, the Starwalk app for Starwalk 2 now that always alerts me to any kind of interesting uh, astro- astronomical events that are going on. And, uh, and yeah, that was exactly what I was saying is that. Did you go look at it last night? Uh, we went outside. I didn't, I, uh, but I, it went out too early and then I got distracted. I got on the phone with my friend and then it it got late and I forgot about it. I took a look at it the night before and it was pretty bright and orange. Yeah. 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 I have to go try to check it out. It might still be kind of close. Yeah, I think so. That's awesome. Yeah. It's always fun to do that. The moon that just happened, uh, the last full moon that we had. That thing was huge. It was one of the super moons. I love the super moon yeah. when it comes up, man. The freaking thing is just amazing. I find that I don't sleep well on those nights. Yeah. Not because I don't have, you know, curtains pulled. Like whenever there's a full moon, for some reason, I feel like I have a restless sleep. I don't know what that's about. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, everybody kind of goes a little crazy whenever the full moon happens, <laughs> right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was in the process of celebrating every time the full moon was coming out, man. It's always like that's the night to really party and be exuberant and yeah, and uh, and try to go fucking nuts. Lately, it's been orange harvest moon, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we need to get more of those shots going. We've been doing, uh, I was going out uh, shooting a lot of time lapses of the sunsets and the sunrises out in the mountains. And uh, I just never got them up online. I, I get so I get so wrapped up in all these other things that are going on. I can't finish these projects, but they are some beautiful shots, man. Some amazing stuff you can get going uh, whenever you're paying attention to the cycle of the moon and yeah, and how everything's going to the stars. I live pretty close to Red Rock Park, so uh, there have been a few few nights where I've, it's a clear clear night, and I've dr- driven out there in the evening just to stargaze, and it's amazing. Um, how lit up the sky is once you get out of the city. Yeah, it's nice to get away from the uh, the lights. You ever go rock climbing out there? What? I haven't in a while, but I used to go pretty regularly. Nice. I uh, in- always enjoyed not taking the trails <laughs> and making my own trails, which was fine on the on the way up the mountain. The way down was kind of difficult because uh, you would come to a point and realize that you had to climb back up to find another way down. Uh, so, uh, the down was a lot longer than the going up. <laughs> yeah, I did that. Uh, I did that. I was out in Arizona, uh, on a gig and, uh, it was, it was just this time last year too. Um, I'm going through uh sober October right now where I just completely purify my body, just eating vegetables and, uh, not even drinking caffeine. And by the end of the month, uh, it, really takes its effect on you and you start feeling fantastic and uh, around uh around the end of the month like 29th 30th or something like that i was out doing a gig in arizona right behind this mountain and we had a big long break and i climbed all the way up the other side of the mountain like there's all these trails everyone's hiking up and then there's just this flat side across and i was like i can i can get up there no fucking problem. And I was just feeling so great. I said, fuck it. I'm going up there in my blacks and I can climb the mountain in my work clothes and <laughs> popped over the side of a cliff while people are hiking up. They're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> but yeah, it was one of the, it was, it was a great, it was a great time, man. Uh, and it just felt fantastic to be able to do and, and, you know, not really get winded from smoking or anything like that. Right. Well, good for you. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And I got my buddies about to take me out to Red Rocks as well. They're going to be showing me how to rappel down the cliffs and hopefully we'll be filming it. I have a couple buddies I've had on this show that uh, they have um, drone cameras. And oh, so they're cool. going to be following us around some of these adventures that we try to do and, and start shooting us with drones. And it's just going to be a, it should be pretty fun, man. Look out for rattlesnakes. I've seen them out there before. Oh, yeah? Especially when you get off the, the trails. Dude, rattlesnakes are no joke, man. <laughs> right. I used to uh, I used to read water meters out in uh, Arizona as well when I was going to college, and they like to um, burrow in the meters. Oh, I so can, you'll pop I can the see meter, that. and then they're just like, "Well, this is my home now," and then they just strike at you like without warning. There's no rattle or nothing. Um, now, one time I I had one do that. It fucking just shot right out of a hole at me, and I dove back and dropped the lid, and uh, 
and the lid landed right on its tail vaguely and the thing kind of just sprung out and stopped in midair and smacked on the ground and then of course i took my stick and decapitated that son of a bitch so i could do my job right not that it's cool to kill animals all the time but when they're poisonous and they want to kill you in the middle of the desert i don't feel like hopping in a helicopter and getting airlifted to a hospital because a rattlesnake bit me right no that wouldn't be fun yeah i I, the only snake I ever liked was when I was working at a pet store. It was a red albino corn snake. Oh, those are so pretty. Yeah, and it really got to know that they do have personalities. I mean, uh, but yeah, in the wild or on my, if, you know, if you're on my property, then you're like an intruder, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hasta la vista. Yeah. Yeah, you can't be fucking around with those things, man, you know? Snakes are dangerous. Although they're great pest control, if they're not venomous, you know, they can uh, they can really clean up your rat and, and mice problem if you have it or going around the house. And I mean, out in the desert, it's hard not to have some of these uh, desert-dwelling pests, right. you know, invading your space. So, yeah, Angela and I were always talking about getting a snake, but we never did. We got the little, we got little Daphne going on, and I, I always wanted to raise um, Burmese pythons growing up, but they get so freaking big. They get like 30 feet long. They're, yeah, they're pretty amazing animals, though, man. It takes like uh, I, I I remember going and seeing a few of those at uh, some of the herpetology place uh, clinics, and they take like four or five guys to get one snake out of the back of a truck. How do you feed those? You uh, you feed them small pigs. So as they grow up, you're feeding them like uh, rats, and then um, you know guinea pigs, and then once they get like to twenty, thirty feet, you have to go to the farm and and get like a, a fucking pig and you have to f- take him outside let the pig loose outside because you can't just throw a pig in the room you keep them in because you don't want them getting used to feeding inside of their their chambers that you keep them in their home because then if you enter there to clean or anything like that they're like well i eat in here too so you're fucking food now too it's a 30 foot python could be a great way to dispose of a body though if you ever killed somebody or oh yeah yeah Although they do like live food, I don't know if they would. Uh, they probably they probably go for it. I know if people that have been able to f- feed them like frozen uh, rats and stuff like that, you dethaw them and they'll they'll actually eat them. Yeah, when I worked at that pet store, there was one um, boa, I think it was a boa, and uh, that snake wouldn't eat live mice. So I I said, oh well, what do you do for that? And the girl training me picked up a mouse by the tail and slammed it against the wall and picked it up off the floor and threw it in there and said, that's how you do it. And I was like, okay, you can feed that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how like monitor lizards do it, man. They'll, they'll pick up the, a rat or a mouse and they'll, they'll just fucking smack it into the wall or into the ground. Until I saw two monitor lizards tear a mouse in two Oof. working there. There were a lot of gory uh, stories with mice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, nature, man. Yeah. And I used to, uh, I used to raise uh, snakes growing up, and uh, I had all kinds of different ones. I had a very large red tail boa, and I'd raise rats for it. And uh, I really enjoyed the whole raising the rats part of it. Like, that was, that was really cool, you know? And it, now people are like, they'll have a reaction to a rat. Like, they're terrified of this little monster thing, and I just go, that thing's adorable. Look at that little rat, you know? Because they're so sweet. They're really nice animals whenever you're raising them and... and but then you got to feed them to the snake. Right. Then you name them. <laughs> Don't name them bye when bye you're raising fluffy. food. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Now I just do the fish tank. My yeah. fish tank is more than enough. That thing is a mess. Don't ever get into saltwater aquariums. I, I think they're beautiful, but yeah, I probably would not have the patience for it. Yeah. It's a, it's a full-time job keeping, the, uh, keeping a coral reef going. But it is amazing. It's amazing. I had two goldfish um, about six months ago um, in a bowl, and I kept them for about a year and a half. Their names were Kiki and Kaka, but <laughs> they committed suicide um, one week. One jumped out of the tank, uh, and I found him dead uh, when I woke up to feed them, and then the, like. About a week later, the other one jumped out of the tank, and I found her on the kitchen counter, and I grabbed her and put her in the bowl because she was still breathing, 
And she lived for about two more days and then died. Oh, uh, yeah. So, I don't know. A little Romeo and Juliet it, action going yeah, on. Yeah, I guess I named them wrong. <laughs> I mean, Kiki and Kaka. I liked them a lot, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, goldfish are a trip, man. Those things, uh, people get those at carnivals, and then they'll just freaking live forever and never die on them for some reason. But I've had I've had plenty of fish jump out of my my tanks as well. I had to have a custom rim put around the top of the tank, so it makes it really difficult for them to get out. But they'll still somehow manage to like arch back over the whole. It's a six inch border around the glass, so they'll be able to jump over the whole border, and then I'll, I'll wake up in the morning and fight find uh dried out fish on the floor maybe uh they were just trying to reach the re- remote control <laughs> and maybe mine were just mine were in the kitchen so maybe mine were just trying to reach the like refrigerator door <laughs> they just wanted more snacks <laughs> uh, that's funny so you went and you you said you were in arizona were you yeah. doing a gig there uh, yeah, I was doing one of my uh, one of my corporate gigs that I was uh, out there. Just uh, I forget what it was. When was that? That was uh, that was at the end of uh, October last year oh, into oh, the beginning okay. of November. Oh, okay. And yeah, it was also it was before it was the before shit the, the, the shit hit the fan. Yeah, yeah. it was part of uh, it was just relating because of the sober October thing that I'm doing but yeah it did was did you do that last year too yeah it was the first year I did it last year um I, I get it from the Joe Rogan podcast that I like to watch oh okay and although I don't think he's doing it this year he said something about I'm going to be doing so much DMT <laughs> I won't have time to be sober right which is just insane to me t- to do DMT over and over and over again because that's such an insane experience but um uh, but yeah he uh He's a, it's a good encouragement to get people off the booze. Although I don't, I don't really drink. I just, I just smoke way too much pot. That's my problem. But uh, it gets people to realize, you know, I don't know how much damage they're doing to their body. And a lot of my friends, I try to um, encourage them to like participate in it. And no one's interested. You know, no one wants to take that step of like um, of of cleaning their system out for four weeks. Right. And, um, I have several friends that, that, uh, detox for some reason in July and January. Huh? I don't know why they picked those months. Was the first and the seventh or month, the year, every, every, every six months. I guess they so. detox. Yeah. Now that's smart, man. Cause it gets you, uh, a, it keeps your body nice and fresh and B when you start smoking or drinking or whatever you're doing again, you know, you're a lightweight. And so you can get, you know, it actually hits you really hard. Um, so you save money. You save money and you get fucked up again. Because, like, once you, I mean, like, especially with um, something like marijuana or even alcohol, uh, you know, you kind of become normal when you're drinking if you're doing it every day. Uh, and so it's more of a, a thing to just mellow you out and keep you on that balanced yeah, level. Maybe you don't appreciate that buzz as much. Yeah, you don't. Not at all. And I... Uh, yeah, I it becomes I less smoke special. Like a little bit right? of weed after it, and then it's, it fucking makes me so high. And like before, it's just you're smoking weed like cigarettes after a little while, and you're just doing it because that's what you smoke, and it doesn't uh, really get I you that high. I can't do that. One hit, and I'm um, of marijuana, and I'm and I don't smoke often, but yeah, uh, when it's around, and I do, um, yeah, if I take more than one hit, I just I'm ready to go to sleep. Yeah, but it, all of it, even the even the ones they say don't make you sleepy. I don't remember which is which. Indica. Sativa makes oh. you up, and indica brings you down. It's okay. more body high. Well, both of them. I mean, all marijuana just seems to kind of make me sleepy anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic that they uh, they finally made that shit legal out here in Nevada and, and a lot of states. And yeah, uh, and, and the first year it was legal. Uh, didn't the state make how, I mean, how much money in, ta- in tax dollars off of it? I don't know. I can look it up. I think it was like thirty million dollars or something that they made. Could have been three million, maybe thirty millions. Shooting it over, there was a three involved somehow. But um, they made a lot of money off of it. And boom, right there. The state highest expectations. Elevator. It says. Fuck, 500 million by June. Wow. 
uh, and that's uh, the taxes that they made. Netting total tax revenue in the neighborhood of seventy million. All right, there you go. And twenty million went to schools. Twenty five million went to schools. Uh, yeah, and that was only halfway through the year. That, uh, and, and this is just one article. It was just giving estimates. Let's see here. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive what happened with that, and uh, it really started paying the bills literally for a lot yeah. of things. And hopefully, but see, the, and then what sucks is the schools started like denying those funds too. Some of the schools were like, "Well, we don't want your drug money," and it's like, "Well, fuck, man." I mean, we're trying to public education's a joke. You know, like, I, I mean, I got a public education growing up, which is not an education. I've had right. to start. Where did you grow up? Uh, in California, I grew oh, okay. up in Stockton, California. Yeah, and unfortunately, the schools here don't have a good um, rating as far as the education. Yeah, I think we're like 47th in the country or something like mm, that, like really on the far end. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah, and yeah, so that for them to be denying the money too is just really sad. Because, um, like, I know when I was growing up, we didn't have um, like drama. I went to, I took the drama class. And it was like, uh, what play are we putting on this year? And they're like, that's a fucking funny joke. Watch this movie. Shut the fuck up. Oh, really? You didn't even... Oh, growing up in Arkansas, we put on plays. And I went to public high school. And did you? Yeah. I well, mean, there were the only private schools in the town I was um, from, I think, were Catholic schools. So I was not raised Catholic. So um, uh, there may have been another one. I'm, I'm, not mis- I'm not sure. But they were the only private schools were religious schools. So... Um, but we did all sorts of plays, but yeah, there was always a, a budget that our teacher was talking to us about. And we always had to like make our own costumes or, you know, paint the, you know, we all came together to paint the set and everything like that. I remember the first play I did, uh, it was a musical called the pajama game, the pajama game. Yeah. The movie is a Doris Day movie, but the, the, the play, uh, I don't know who, who was in that, but I was really not interested in in I, I didn't I guess I didn't have a lot of school spirit at that time and I I told the teacher I wanted the part of Joe or nothing because <laughs> Joe was not very demanding and I wouldn't have to be there every night and I got it and realized like how close you became to all these people it became like a family and you put your heart and soul in it and it was it was great so then from there on out I I uh, was hooked and continued to do it, and it was always a little bitter, bittersweet. Like the last night, we'd only, we'd, you know, we'd rehearse and practice for a few months, and then we'd just perform three performances: uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And it was always kind of like sad to see it all end after all that work. Yeah, and you become such a a family, and you gotten to know kids that you would have never gotten to know in that way, you know. So. Yeah, I only got to do one play, and it was uh, like seventh grade, something like that, during summer school. What play was it? I don't even remember at all. Like, uh, I it was so long ago, and we just did one performance of it, and it was just a real quick, like, in and out production, you know, because it was summer school. It wasn't like we had the year to perform it or anything. It was just, like put it together in a few weeks. Yeah, I loved the experience, and that's why I joined the drama club when I was in uh, in high school and went to the theater classes and stuff. But then they were just like not happening. The favorite one I ever did was called The Man Who Came to Dinner. And in the movie of that, it's uh, got like, um, who's the guy who goes, who's that old, old actor? I don't know. The Man Who Came to Dinner? Yeah. Had Betty Davis in it. And then later when I moved to New York, I went to see it on Broadway and it had Nathan Lang and Gene Smart and it had a great cast. So it was really exciting. And sitting behind me, was Mel Brooks and M. Bancroft. Really? Yeah. That's fantastic. I love Mel Brooks. Yeah. Man, he couldn't get away with any of that shit today. <laughs> you imagine if they put Blazing Saddles out today, people would be right. picketing that shit. I was just re-watching some of 30 Rock. Okay. Do you remember that show? I love 30 Rock. Yeah. And um, they took Parks and Recreation off Amazon, and I was like... Ah, <laughs> love that show. So I started walking, watching well. 30 Rock, and I couldn't believe how much, um, like, kind of racist humor is in it. And I thought, wow, I don't know that this would, this would um, air the same way. And that's not even yeah. a very, very old show. 
Yeah, and it's not even that the the jokes are that bad, really. You know, they just have to do with ethnicity, ethnicity, uh, and and people would just get a lot up in arms about that now. I know a lot of people are just paranoid as hell about saying anything. Um, even the like when I have people on the show, they'll be like, "We can't talk about this. We can't talk about this. We can't talk about this." I got to, you know, it's like, right, man, you know, just. Uh, then when you talk whole, about the weather. Yeah, that whole cancel <laughs> culture has got people just so terrified to say anything on camera. Yeah. And it's, it's a real shame because it just really stifles creativity. And, uh, and, and But one thing that's cool about it is people who don't care, they have this whole new uh, audience to piss off. Right. Which is great. Well, that's social media, um, I guess, has given people courage and fear because... Some people, you know, realize that they're constantly being watched. They're constantly, you know, you can't do, say anything or post anything without somebody having something to say about it. But then, on the other hand, a lot of the people that, like, sit there and, like, type, like, these terrible attacks, attacks t towards you, you know, um, they probably feel empowered because they're just sitting on the couch at home. You know, nobody's going to come after them. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and, the, and that shit's just really sad too. I know a lot of people that just do that. Their their existence is to sit on social media all day. Like I, uh, I stop posting anything that doesn't have to do with the show. Like all I do is say, "Here's my show. Here's my show. Here's my show." Because I got sick of it, and I and I post and I run the fuck away. You know, like I'm not gonna scroll or look at anybody's garbage anymore because it's just so negative. Sometimes Instagram's okay. You know, it's like nice pictures and stuff, but like definitely Facebook and Twitter. It's just um, Twitter. It's just hate. Yeah, and Twitter's not very garbage. pretty to look at either. It's yeah. I'm so visual. For me, it's you know, and I don't really like the limitation limitations on how many words you can put up and everything. But yes, it has gotten very political. Facebook, yeah, people tend to bring a lot of drama to Facebook. So oh yeah, Instagram has kind of become my favorite just because it's visual or there's videos it doesn't seem like people are on there to start wars really um, yeah it's nice pictures and cool and funny stuff right right but it's definitely a necessity to stay in i i don't tweet very often but it's you know in the world that we live in if you are trying to market something it's like the platforms oh yeah that you have to be involved with so yeah and that's where i just i i i post all my stuff and then I go, you just get off of there. Just get out of there. You you did your job, right? You got on. You posted. You're you're presenting a presence to the world. Um, you don't have to scroll down and start commenting and liking and doing all this. It becomes an addiction. All of a sudden, an hour's gone by. I'm kind of pissed off. You know, my heart's beating because I'm like arguing with somebody about something I don't even care about. And uh, and it's always the same goddamn people too. You know, I feel like they're sitting on their phones or sitting on their computers or whatever they're doing for like eight, nine, ten hours a day. They're just always attached to that social media outlet, and they get they have to have the notifications turned on for sure to where it's just like ding in their phone all the time. Right, yeah. And I, I, I leave my phone on silent a lot, and I leave it in a different room a lot too. Yes. And uh, I'm proud of that. It's a good habit. <laughs> I, do, I do scroll and like uh, other people's things, but... I'm not a big comment person. I uh, I guess I just don't take the time to um, to to comment. Really, I'll give you a thumbs up or whatever. But yeah, yeah, you should drive me nuts. Um, I would I would I would find something that it would just be like for some reason I have to say something about this ridiculous post or somebody's putting stuff out there that's absurd to me, and then. It's like, why? Why do I do that? It's dumb. It doesn't, it's not going to get me anything but an argument. Right. Food, the food photographs uh, get on my nerves sometimes because unless you're really setting food up to look beautiful, yeah, it usually looks like your breakfast burrito that you're having somewhere usually looks like vomit on your plate. <laughs> so food photographs uh, are not my favorite because they don't photograph too well. Maybe dessert photographs better than... Um, you know, an omelet or something, but yeah, it's it's always like I don't. No offense, I just don't need to really know what you're eating. That doesn't really seem like uh yeah. Something why do you, why do you tell the whole world about what your lunch is? Yeah, nobody gives you shit what your lunch is. Right. Yeah, I've often thought it would be 
uh, kind of funny to like have a picture of, um, you know, a urinal or something. And then the, the comment could be like, thanks everybody. It was a great champagne toast last night, <laughs> you, know, or, <laughs> you know, cause it's all ending up in the same place, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be the next step, right? They're like, had a great piss, post it. <laughs> Right. You know, like, oh, my God, we don't need to know what you're doing every <laughs> single minute of the day. You know, nobody cares. Um, and it's, and it's, it's the same people that do that dumb shit that are talking about, like, getting chips put into your skin and everyone's tracking you and they're following you on cameras and everything. And it's like, nobody needs to put chips in your skin, homie. You're giving the NSA updates about your whereabouts every fucking 10 minutes. You know, like you're you're voluntarily being you're like tracking yourself to the entire world. Right. Uh, yeah. It's, it's amazing how the ads work, too, on Instagram and Facebook, how you can look up one little thing or click on one little thing. And then all of a sudden you're flooded with that. Um, I don't miss that at all. I have uh, the Alexis in my house. Yeah. And they listen to what you say. And then that shit ends up on your social media stream. Yeah. And uh, you don't even have to, you don't have to type it in. We just be having a conversation about it. Oh, that we were talking about. Right. And it just shows up. So you have to turn it off, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I haven't turned I, it off right now while we're having our conversation yeah. so it doesn't pop up. I know some people that are really paranoid about all that stuff. Um, I guess if somebody wants to listen in on whatever crap I'm talking about. Yeah. That's fine. It's it's not going to bother bother me. I mean, I guess it is an invasion of privacy, but um, at the same time, I guess I'm not going to live my life worried about my devices listening to me or why is that ad there? Although it is crazy sometimes. Yeah. It's kind of like, wow. Well, they're, he, they're really uh, tracking all this. Yeah. It's, it's And it's not even people doing it. It's computer algorithms. Right, data. And anytime you, um, like any device you have the Facebook app installed on, you gave them permission to access your camera and your photos and your microphone. Right. And they use that permission. They always are listening to your microphone, right? And then anytime they catch catchphrases that sync up with their advertisers, they're going to they're gonna nail you. And that's really what they're after, right? But, I mean, it could be used for any nefarious activity if you really, I mean, if some evil son of a bitch got a hold of all that, right, then uh, it could really go down a dark dystopian tunnel right. real fast. Although maybe on the flip side, maybe if somebody uh, that has a Facebook account is doing some hideous crime, maybe they'd somehow be able to uh, track them and find them or I don't know. Yeah, well, there was the, um, there was the case where um, the guy killed his wife, but there was no, like, I, I th he was saying that someone must have broken and killed her or whatever. And, but he had an Alexa. Oh, wow. And so they were able to go back and listen, and they can hear him killing his wife, and that was the end of that. And, uh, and so that solved, and that like solved the murder. Wow. The, Alexa is a uh, detective. Yeah. <laughs> She's a spy. She's a secret agent. Da -na, da -na. So, and then the fucking NSA is doing it. Like they, um, if you listen to um, the Joe Rogan podcast again, they had, um, what's his name? Edward Snowden. They've had him on twice now, and I bought his book because of it. That was um, he, He's a fascinating individual, but he's talking about how they just, they just collect all this raw data on you constantly, and it's just piling up in a file. And any time, if you fuck up, you know, they're going to be like, oh, pull that file from that guy. I mean, they're not sitting there scouring everyone's files trying to pin stuff on people, right? Which is what the paranoid people are, are really like, oh my God, well, they could just go scour everybody's files and find any little random thing that they do and, and start arresting people for dumb bullshit. And it's like, it's more like if you fuck up and the FBI is like interested in you, now they're going to pull your file and they're going to go back to this huge catalog of information of all the, like, then it, it doesn't go anywhere. Wow. Um, I believe he was saying all the way back to the 80s, they have... Um, the 80s? Yeah, like all your phone records. So, that, I mean, obviously they don't have recordings. Right. But as it progressed, now they have recordings. But it's like literally... Um, so for me, I was like born in 1985. And so every single phone call I've ever made, the government has who I called or who called me on a record. Wow. And uh, yeah, and then all the way up into... I mean, my literally my whole life is is... is that's in a file nuts. somewhere 
everybody I've ever called, everybody I've ever communicated with. And then now with the Alexa things, 24 hour surveillance of every conversation I've ever had. I wonder, I lost touch with somebody in New York I'd like to find. I wonder if they could help me out. (laughs) They definitely can. She worked for MTV. I wonder what she's doing now. Anyway. Yeah, and they all got the rights to do that because of, um, you know, 9-11s where it really became a fucking problem because they, they pushed all those bills forward so that they could investigate terrorism. But then they, they literally say, well, we need to track everybody so that everybody could possibly be a terrorist. And, we, you know, and they haven't actually successfully used this to catch anybody. Mm. But everybody's under surveillance through it. It's insane. It's friggin' crazy. And it's totally a violation of human rights. Right. But unless you go off the grid and um, move, I don't know where you move to, out, you, out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Oh, well, the Amish are off the grid, aren't they? Yeah, the Amish do it right, right? They don't have, they don't have any modern technology going on. And, uh, but, I mean, I, I, I could get into that, I guess. I but, think I would go insanely crazy bored. Yeah, but I, you know, um, I was reading a, some stuff on on the Amish, and they allow and encourage, I guess, their youth when you turn eighteen or or you become of age. They encourage you to go out in the world for as long as you want, yeah. and uh, if you decide to stay out, fine. But when you come back, if you want back in, you um, you have to like vow, you know, to, and you don't ever have to tell them. Like what you did, yeah. Out in the real wor- world, most Rum of them, springer. yeah. Most of them come back because they don't ha- know how to have a conversation with any kind of modern person. They don't know how to do anything really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, except whittle wood or you know fix build a house. I guess they know how to do. But um, as oh. far as current events, that's kind of you know. Oh. I, I don't know what their current events are. I don't, <laughs> they raised another barn this week, right? Right. A lot of them end up on uh, like uh, psychedelic drugs and stuff. They'll come out and they'll do ecstasy and they'll go dance all night. And then it's like, but then you come down off that ecstasy and it's like, well, that's hell. Especially for someone who's never had to deal with the chemical substance coming out of their body. That's a rough one. And uh, and that's really a common thing for uh, the Rumpshmingen that I've heard and read in any ways that, uh, that they go out to these these nightlife events, right? The, the, the big thing that's missing from those, uh, right. Do they have, can, are they allowed Amish to existence? drink? Well, yeah, they can do whatever they want. No, I mean, when they're Amish, did the Amish drink? I don't know. Let me look it up online. I mean, I, th- I think that once they're married, they, I, I don't think they're for premarital sex. And I think that once you're married, they really want you to like stay married. I guess that's every, everyone hopes that you're going to stay married if you get married, but. Oh, they don't even smoke cigarettes. Oh. Uh, alcohol and tobacco abuse is prohibited. What about caffeine? Uh, let's see. Love the internet. Right. It's watching you. It is. I got a little camera right here. <laughs> it's 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 keeping track of me. It's got, uh, you know, it's like looking at where my eyes are looking and shit. Uh, they drink coffee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, they brew French press. Maybe they grow coffee beans and, and um, you know, it's like the Mormons, you know, they don't drink caffeine or believe in gambling, yet they own casinos here in Vegas. It's <laughs> kind of funny. Do they really? Yeah. That's funny. Freaking Mormons are uh, amazing, man. Like They're a tight cult. They're yeah. really, uh, they've got each other's back. Yeah, and they're some of the nicest people too, yeah. right? Like. Of all the uh, the the religions out there, uh, freaking Mormons, man. They like, are very nice. However, they really, if you're not Mormon, yeah. I don't know how close you can really get to them. I mean, I've been, uh, I've I've had several um, Mormon families like in my life, right, where I have like friends with them at school, right. or like uh, I knew people that were musicians that were Mormons, uh, and. And I've gone to like, their they, house whoa, whoa, for dinner. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. What kind of music were they making? Imagine Dragons. Oh, really? Yeah, I used to do front of house for Imagine Dragons. That whole band was, well, now it's not, right? I didn't know they were. Now only two of them are, but... Um, oh, you, so I auditioned for a Mormon music label. Yeah. Uh, the one that... 
now I can't think of the name of it. Gladys Knight is Mormon, and she's on that label. Okay. Um, and they were really interested, but I have a James Taylor song that I've covered, uh, Don't Let Me Be Lonely Tonight, and it has the word damn in it. And they wanted me to take that down. And then uh, I do a song that's a uh, Johnny Mercer lyric called Drinking Again. And they wanted me to, of course, take that down. And um, bottom line, I don't think they they um, signed me because I wasn't Mormon. Uh, Glass Knight has six record labels. Motown, Buddha Records, MCA Records, Columbia Records, Verve Records, VJ Records. So maybe that last one? VJ Records, V-E-E-J-A-Y. I, w- I wonder if that's the one. It might have been the one. She, I didn't know she had six record labels. Damn. Yeah, that's crazy, though. They're they're not even into any even a, a, the slightest bit of swearing or right. alcohol uh, suggestive lyrics. Right. And when I was there, there were no, uh, in like the main areas, it was really hard to find a Starbucks, basically. Okay. Because they don't promote coffee that, like and then my friend who was mormon also pointed out that um there was no um no no victoria's secrets anywhere because they don't <laughs> want to show that much skin but but it was beautiful it was a super clean city um uh i'd go back i mean it was really a really pretty place and yeah every mormon i've met they've all been really positive and sweet people right the nicest freaking people on the planet yeah. I yeah. can't. I, I can't come up with anything really bad to say about anybody I've ever met that's Mormon. I can only come up with fantastic things to say about them because yeah. they they live a great life. You know, they live really clean and they're like they're the nicest. They're the nicest people. Their whole family's just so nice. I've never met a Mormon who's a dickhead. Right. The uh, the friend of mine that was Mormon also told me because he took me to the Mormon the big Mormon temple there and was explaining a lot of things to me and. He said that the one thing they needed to really focus on changing was their chastity laws because it's so strict that everybody gets married, you know, as soon as they're out of high school and they're allowed to get married, they get married just so they can have sex. And he said that their divorce rate was 85%. That makes sense. In the youth. Yeah. So that's not cool, <laughs> especially when you're not supposed to get divorced. In you know, I mean, you can, but... Um, they're, you know, it's frowned upon. I think you have to take a lot of, I don't know what kind of classes you have to take if you're going to go through a divorce. But Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, you're not going to break this rule, but then you're going to break this rule. Right. Right, because the, this rule isn't really realistic. Right. The whole uh, just don't have sex, the abstinent thing, that doesn't, when does that ever work anywhere, right. ever? You know, all you're going to do is get kids not using protection and, uh, and lying to you because they're not allowed to let you know what's going on in their life anymore because they'll get in trouble because they're teenagers and teenagers want to fuck everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, and experience everything. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was, I mean, from, I, I remember growing up, I was really well behaved, straight A student all the way up until about 13 years old. And then I didn't give a shit. I didn't care about anything but getting laid and like playing guitar because guitar will get me laid and it was just my whole brain just shut down it was like it was like hypnosis or like mind control your hormones just spike and you can't think about anything else properly right and and well with the chastity thing it's kind of like would you buy a car without test driving it right (laughs) never (laughs) so that's hard to say i'm going to spin the rest of my life with this person, but I've never seen them naked or, um, you know, ever had sex in the first place. Right. 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 Not either one of you knows how this, this game goes or what you're into. Right. And, uh, but yeah, let's sign a contract with the government. And it's like, that's not a, that's not a way, that's not a good way to like conduct your life. Um, but then the other side of it, right? Like, have you ever seen any of the documentaries on like arranged marriages? Yes, uh, not not the documentaries, but I've read some stuff about it. And how, like, like it seems like such a terrible thing that you're just going to make me marry some person I've never met or, you know, like, a, this is just, like, written, you guys decided my life for me. And then those marriages end up working out really well. Right. Which is, to me, it doesn't seem like it would make sense intuitively, but then I guess it's it's really this 
devotion that the two people have for each other afterwards. And it's not this whole like, um, I, I think the, one of the big things about it is it's not about romantic love where it's like, Oh, I love this person so much. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with them. Right. It's more like what the Buddhists would call Dharma. This is what I'm, this is my life. This is, this is what I I'm doing with my life. It's, it's, I was born and this is the story of me and right. I marry this person because of course I marry this person. Uh, and then they seem to manage their relationship a lot better. A yoga guru I used to follow um, had an arranged marriage. And he said, you know, we rather than trying to find fault in each other, we try to um, find the good in each other and, and work on ourselves. And uh, I, he seemed very content with his arranged marriage. Yeah, a lot of people do, which... I mean, yeah, the more you talk about it, it seems like, yeah, I guess that would work because you're not really choosing that person to be then then it's not a choice you fucked up right you didn't go oh i made a huge mistake because i made the wrong decision in my life you didn't make the decision this is these are the this is the hand you were dealt right um so yeah that's that's always been an interesting one because you'd figure what if the hand you're dealt is a slob and uh, lazy and a, right. <laughs> i don't know i mean there could be things that you oh of course yeah but uh yeah, it's uh, that wouldn't I wouldn't want that, but um, no, yeah, definitely you're, not. You're right. It does seem that it really works for some people. Yeah, more than you think it would. Right. I think the divorce rate. Let me look that up too. I bet the divorce rates are way lower for that. Like uh, compared to, I know, I know, just like in America, right? It's fifty fifty. Like yeah. You get married fifty percent of marriages in a divorce. Right. But uh, I bet uh, I bet that's a lot lower though. I wonder if that that's gone up in America. I mean, I, I remember it used to be 50 like 10 years ago, so I wonder if it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeez. Less than 4% wow. for arranged marriages versus 40% of marriages in, uh, in the United States. 40%? Yeah. 40% in the United States end in di divorce? That's what this one article says. Okay. And the then top the, of Google. the arranged marriages is 4%. Wow. Yeah, le less than 4%, it says. So they just, they do well. They do well with each other because I guess you're not making that decision in the first place. So you're dealing with the hand you're dealt kind of thing. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a trip. I've watched a couple of documentaries on it that are, it was pretty interesting. It opened my eyes to the whole concept. Not that I am into that at all. Right. Like I like to make my own choices. Right. But, uh, but just numbers, numbers are numbers, man. You know, that's, they don't lie. It's, it's kind of a trip. You wouldn't expect that. No. Get out. Maybe it also has to do with a, a lot with the way they're brought up, though, or something. Right. That cul that, the the cultural uh, yeah, like background. Yeah, that's what they're they're expected. That's what's expected of them. Maybe it's they feel like a a strict uh, kind of disciplined. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, I wonder if they're not monogamous either. They're like, well, this is my wife and this is my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that's the way. What? Uh, is that the Mormons that can have more than one wife? Oh yeah, the Mormons. The Mormons. <laughs> uh, what was that TV of, show? Wasn't it. there a TV show that that guy had like nine wives and he was a jerk? And really? He, yeah, I think there was. And he was a Mormon guy. And he'd like a dinner introduce in numbers a new female into his herd. <laughs> Sister wives. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. Sister, Sister wives. wives. He's got yeah. a bunch. Yeah. I don't watch like reality TV because it's total trash. But uh, that I I remember people um, really liking that one. There's another one. My five wives. There's think, a bunch of them. Well, I think the one that was most popular was Sister Wives. But I'm not an expert on on um, any of that. I don't have live TV. You know. Yeah, I, and no, I haven't got rid of that a while years. ago. I can't do commercials. Yeah, that pisses me off. Like, um, I. I did it for football and I wanted to, and then I just, I lost interest in football. Um, so I got rid of it, but, uh, that was like the only reason I had cable was to watch the games and man, like cables, like over a hundred dollars. And then they bl blast you with commercials the whole time. Like so many freaking commercials, like a 30 minute program is going right. to give you like 11 minutes of commercials half the time. Or like, have you ever watched Dr. Phil? I, I no, turned on the TV. I, I haven't actually. <laughs> I turned on the TV in my hotel room, and Doctor Phil was on, and uh, and that motherfucker, he, 
he does like two minutes of his show. He's like, I'm going to introduce my next guest right after these commercials. It's like, you just came back from commercials. He's like, welcome back. So my next guest is a spoiled little brat, and his mom says he's just out of control, and we're going to introduce him. He'll come out right after these commercials. I was oh, like, that was 30 seconds. Geez. And the whole show is just like him introducing commercials, and then it's like six minutes of commercials. And uh, and I and it's like, man, people pay money to for this to come on their television. Right. It's crazy to me. And with all the different ones, even if you had like Amazon Prime, Netflix, and Hulu, and even like the big package of Hulu, which I think is like $45, with the one that they offer some, lo- like ch- they offer some channels that are oh, yeah. more like um, uh, live like, TV. Right. Uh, I think that would still be less than, than ordering actual cable. Yeah. Oh, it's totally less. Yeah. And uh, and it's better programming, and right. it's instant. Everything's on demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, I, just cable doesn't make any sense anymore. No, it makes it really no doesn't. sense. Like if I want to watch something, like YouTube has it for free. Right? Mm-hmm. Like like the debates that happened, right? Like oh, I got to pay attention to you know reality. And I was like, yeah, but I can just watch it on YouTube. Why am I going to pay one hundred nineteen dollars a month to have live information streaming right. in my house all the time? Uh, and then it, recently we got rid of everything. We just kept Amazon Prime. Yeah. And so it's just YouTube and Amazon Prime, and I don't miss it at all. Well, I mean, how much TV do we really need to watch, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a, maybe a little in the evening, and then, and then that's it. That's yeah. That's all I do. We we, we put on a movie when we sit down for dinner. We're just like, right. oh, what do you want to watch while we're eating dinner, and then we go to bed. I usually put on um, not every. Every night, but a little something like to kind of to fall asleep. Yeah, I or like just to kind of relax that. in bed for a while and then click. I've been trying to transition to reading my book in bed, although I'm terrible at it because for me personally, I've always had a TV in my bedroom since I was a little kid. I've had a TV in my bedroom, and so that's a that's the hardest uh, compulsive habit or addiction, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that I have to break. I still haven't broken. I've broken damn near all my compulsive habits um, over this pandemic period. I've I've been going after my brain and yeah. fixing a bunch of shit. Good. And uh, but that one's a really hard one. Just to not have the TV on while I'm going to bed. I've been doing it my like literally every every night my whole life. I get in spurts with with a book where I'll get addicted to the book and then have to read it every evening. And, and uh, January uh, before. You know, everything happened. Um, I spent a month in Mexico, so the TV there was in Spanish. <laughs> and I did have my um, iPad with me, which I could have watched movies on, but instead I read three books while I was there, so that was kind of nice. Nice. They actually screw you. Um, that happened. We went to Mexico two years ago, and I went out of my way to get, like, because uh, the, the, the stuff on TV wasn't really great. And it's like, dude, I'm in Mexico. What are you doing, right? Like, it's, this is a self-realization moment for me personally because I, I spent a whole day of my vacation trying to find an adapter to get my iPad to sync to the TV. And then I finally got it to work. Like I found a cable that works, right? And uh, and we're like taking buses to like Mexican malls and stuff like that. And uh, and then it's like, oh, well, you, you're you hooked up to international internet service. And so we're it's not going to work right now. And you couldn't even like play Netflix at oh, all. Well, I didn't even try, I don't think, so. And so I wasted an entire day of my vacation being a dick. Nice. Yeah, trying to watch TV because I compulsively have to watch TV. Right. Well, hopefully you learned something there. I did. I learned a lot. <laughs> I, I learned a lot on that trip to Mexico. That was a big one for me. That started this whole process where I had a terrible fucking time. And it was just, it was my fault, right? And it was like, you're in paradise and you're just bitch. I was bitching the whole time. You know, because yeah. everything that was going wrong was becoming obsessive. And uh, and I was just like, well, uh, like I paid for this and I, I, you know, we came all the way down here and this is supposed to be my vacation and all this shit's going, you know, like my room got shifted and and uh, the problems aren't what important. It was my, my reaction to the problems. That was the that was really where everything went to shit. Yeah. And I and I got get trapped in that loop of like, well, now my whole day's ruined because this thing happened. And it's like, what a dickhead move that is. <laughs> like, right? And it's and, and I didn't realize how terrible my brain was functioning. And I came back from that and had, I was a mess. I was a total mess. 
and uh, and I started the whole process of like, oh, I got to fix this thing in my head. It's not functioning right. Uh, and and I started reading a lot and, and figuring myself out and realizing I have all these compulsive habits that we all do. We all do it. Right. And I was just a normal American guy who likes TV and, you know, and I just, I wanted to do all the material things and they kept fucking up. The material things kept fucking up on me and it kept ruining my day. And a thought would go by, oh, well, now the whole day's ruined. And it's like, what a, it's just a terrible thought process. It's not the right way for your brain to function. Right. And this whole COVID time, uh, pandemic time, has really made uh, me, and I'm sure a lot of other people, um, really appreciate little small pleasures, you know, or, or appreciate things that you took for granted, you know, before. Oh, yeah. You know. Just you know, going to dinner. Right. Going to dinner or certain things, going to meow wolf in um santa fe which is a arts uh like live visual arts experience you know all those kind of things are shut down and closed because fantastic you can't uh be in there touching things or not social distancing and all that kind of stuff they're going to open one here too it's at area 15 oh my brother uh my brother does sound there now oh all right he installed all the pa equipment over the pandemic and 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 he he runs the big stage they have there i just went there two nights ago for their soft opening oh do they have it finally yeah um which they probably i guess they wanted to just get things going but a lot of things still said coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. But the ground floor uh, is pretty neat, pretty spectacular looking. I got to go check it out now yeah. that it's starting to pop open and everything's starting to I think to the Meow Wolf there is going to open not until after the new year. But, Meow Wolf, huh? Yeah. I'll look that up. But, um, and it's supposed to be even bigger and better than the one that's in uh, in Santa Fe. Yeah, right before the pandemic happened, um, we thankfully had a vacation planned like right before all this shit went down, and uh, and we went to um, where did we go? Santa Fe, and and uh, we went and saw um, no, it was something else. But we went to California and we went to the aquarium and we went and did all this stuff and we we're walking up and down the pier and going to dinner every night. And we came back, and like right after we came back, everything started shutting down systematically. And we're just like, I'm just so thankful that we were able to actually have that one last experience before the world ended. And who knows what, even when things start to really come back, what it's going to look like. Right. Uh, I had just done uh, my last thing was I did a jazz festival in Temecula, California. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had said that the ticket sales were the same as the year before however the turnout was half the turnout because there was already you know this was already in the media it just hadn't like things hadn't shut down yet so there was already a scare happening and then I got back here and uh, I think that weekend I went to like three large gatherings in one night like <laughs> hopping from party to party to party and then the next day everything shut down and it was kind of like oops <laughs> i just saw like uh you know 200 people last night i, I hope that's all right <laughs> <laughs> well thankfully thankfully you didn't get sick right right uh, yeah um temecula man i um whenever that place comes up i i moved down uh to southern california when i was a teenager and uh like 19 not really much of a teenager anymore but uh and uh we were just drinking like crazy anytime we could and i snuck into a bar in temecula and broke my wrist on a mechanical bull ouch and uh i had my girl had like no pockets so i had all of her fucking makeup and shit at this cowboy bar and I get tossed off because my buddy gave the the operator like 20 bucks and said, just fucking kill this guy real quick. And he just took the knob and turned it all the way over when I good got on. Good friend. Yeah, good friend, right? Yeah. And I was I was insistent on not, I wanted my eight seconds, you know? And so I just held on to that fucking bull and it flung me so hard. and it bro- I didn't realize, I was so drunk, I didn't realize my wrist was broken uh, until I started playing pool. And I was just like, that's not, 
working right. <laughs> and, but when I got flung off, I had to go pick up all my girl's lipstick and eyeliner and shit around all these rednecks just screaming at me. Get your lipstick, boy. Um, right. It was just a, it was a it was a fun memory of uh, being a dumb young kid. And how was your pool game uh, being that that drunk? Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I I realized like I realized my hand was totally fucked and I I you know, I, I tried to I tried to move the pool cue and my wrist just is like this limp noodle. And like nothing's really working, and I was like, I am fucking drunk right now because I can't feel any of that. Uh oh. And uh, I had I didn't even know my wrist had broken getting tossed off the pole. But that was a fun one, man. That was a fun one. And picking up my lipstick or my girl's lipstick. <laughs> right. <laughs> and everyone's wearing cowboy hats. Fuck. In Temecula. Huh. Yeah. There's the, some some country bar off this. I've never been to a a bull. Um, Whatever that that is called, when those yeah. restaurants or bars, there's a, isn't yeah. there a chain that has them? Probably. Yeah. I don't even remember what it was called. I probably shouldn't say since I was in there underage, fucking uh, sneaking in. But yeah. I I can't even remember what it was called. Uh, but yeah, that was the the good old days, man, when nothing mattered and I was still drinking alcohol. I drank way too much. And we could all pile in places. Yeah, exactly. There's certain um. Certain p- places that I I used to frequent that that I I mean I'm going out to restaurants and stuff but that I wouldn't even frequent now because it's like well the whole idea of going to that place was to mix and mingle and hop you know hop from the bar to a table over here and then get up on stage and sing a couple of songs and then run over here and hug this person and hug that person so it's kind of like the whole idea of going to that spot is kind of I'm gonna have to go sit in my sit in my seat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. It's it sucks. I used to um, anytime we go out, like I'd always want to go to somewhere that had like karaoke because yeah. if everyone's gonna be drinking and I'm not gonna be drinking, then at least I can hop up on stage every 45 minutes to an hour and have something to do while I'm fucking around with my buddies. Right. And now it's like I ain't trying to get up and sing into that nasty ass microphone and right. end up in the hospital. Right. A lot of places have started, you know keeping like two or three mics and then disinfecting them really well, I guess. But oh yeah. If it's a place where they do things like that. In fact, one place I went, uh, actually had a big, um, jar of Clorox wipes on the grand piano and and they just (laughs) sat there (laughs) for anybody to like grab and use when they, um, entered or exited the stage. Yeah. I always, uh, I always have, um, well, I did anyways, since I'm an audio engineer, I'd always have a, a pocket full of uh, alcohol swabs just because like anytime a band's coming on and off the stage, uh, in between set changes, I'd right. clean all the mics for everybody. And it just gets you, you know, it's those, it's those little things where people are like, that's the best audio engineer in town. It's like, it has nothing to do with me touching buttons or knowing how audio works. It's like, I clean the mics for them, you know? Right. It's those little service things that you do for people. But then yeah, I have those I've, when I do karaoke. I've remembered sitting in different at different clubs or, or places and uh you know, it's not my mic or it's not a mic that's been, you know, cleaned for me or whatever. But pre COVID stuff and um either it would be full of of lipstick, the microphone would just be like packed with lipstick all over it. Like kinda gross. Or there were a couple of times where I'd get up and start singing and the microphone would smell like the worst breath you could ever possibly think of. And you'd just be like, oh, oh turn up the gain so I don't have to t- keep this close to my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned that. Uh, I learned that trick real early in my career. I was working with the bigger gentleman and he would be snacking in between sets, you know, and uh, and then he'd come out and be spitting fucking food and shit into the mm. grill. And... Uh, and it, like it didn't even take a week like that mic got so fucking gross and then i have to show up in the morning or you know n- well not the morning but the morning for me like three in the afternoon and uh i'd have to show up and test everything including talking to that goddamn microphone and, and oh like it got so gross so fast and you see like 
pieces of corn chips and stuff. Uh, I'll just so you had to run it through the dishwasher. Yeah, well, I just took that. I, <laughs> I went and got a new grill and uh, and just swapped it out, <laughs> threw it away, and immediately started the whole process of like I need to go. I need to have alcohol swabs on me all the time. Right. We need to clean this thing. Uh, and then we'd soak them in. I'd soak them in Listerine. I'd have a big jar of Listerine in the back. Nice. And I'd, I'd have like Which two color? grills. Which color of Listerine? The blue? It oh. wouldn't, it would, yeah. My favorite's the brown. The brown? Yeah. That's like turned, the, the turned, flavorless? Yeah, I've turned other people on to it too. Like once they go brown. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's, it, it doesn't have as much sugar in it, I guess. Okay. So it actually leaves your mouth feeling fresh longer. And uh, once you get used to it, you, even my mother, who used to always like the ones that had a lot of flavor to them, um, she now likes the brown one and, and realizes that it probably, you know, works better than the, the ones that taste really good. Oh, uh, yeah. I do the, uh, the alcohol-free, the purple Listerine. Uh. And, uh, and then, like, I'll go to the dentist and they'll hand me like real Listerine with alcohol in it. And they're like, swish this around in your mouth. And I hit that. And it's like my mouth hasn't had alcohol in it in forever. Uh, well, at least since the last time I was at the dentist. And uh, man, that stuff is crazy strong. I can't even, I was like, man, this is just, it's like, I don't know. For, for guys that hasn't put alcohol in his mouth in a while, it's like, that's fucking, it dries your whole mouth out. And, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, the flavor is, is pretty, uh, pretty strong. I don't know. That's the thing not really a great great story when the <laughs> pandemic started my mother uh went to get her teeth cleaned at one point and uh the you know she's been going to the same place for years and the dental hygienist came and said here we need you to gargle with this um for 30 seconds it's it's a cup of it's and she goes oh what is it it's bleach what yeah and my mother said oh like some kind of um you know bleaching agent yeah like a, a ble bleach that's for humans and she went no it's clark's bleach what the frig yeah, and it had been diluted with a certain amount of water and uh apparently she googled it later and there is such a thing as like dental bleach like they dilute it a lot with water but it's really just clark's bleach Really? And I guess they were doing that to make sure that uh, she killed any prospective COVID in her mouth. But uh, that was kind of a nutty uh, story. Oh, there are articles about it online. An update on bleach swishing. Mm. Can you imagine? I mean, just to wash, wash my whites with it, it's like such a strong... Uh... That's crazy. Yeah, it says it kills 99% of bacteria. No shit. There you go. Of course it does. I guess it bleaches your teeth nice and white. Yeah, I was doing one of those. I got one of those, uh, those like, LED teeth whitening mechanisms from, from Amazon. You ever fuck with one of those? They're they're a trip, man. No, I haven't. You put all that gel inside of it, and you, you got to sit there for, like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes with this thing on your mouth and not drool all over yourself just I trying to get your those. teeth whiter it doesn't really work that great no i don't know i paid like i don't know it's probably like a hundred dollars at my dentist to have them do the big professional one where yeah. you put this big fucking thing in your mouth and i don't know none of it really seems to do that much i think you got to do it like all the time but it fucking hurts your teeth crazy yeah if i, if I do buy them i buy the like the gentle ones usually yeah because i worry about like not having enamel one day yeah, yeah, that shit can get bad, man. That shit can get real bad. But rinsing your mouth out with bleach just to get rid of COVID, that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. I don't think they're doing that anymore, but they were in the beginning. At least at her place, they were. Yeah, that's funny, man. Well, yeah. You know what? It's been damn near 90 minutes on this thing oh well there you go we've been trying to uh shorten them up a little bit we were going for two hours before and everyone was bitching at me why are you doing such long fucking podcasts <laughs> well people's <laughs> attention spans have uh you know can't handle what they used to be able to handle right Let i mean see. 
even with live shows, if you if you do more than ninety minutes, it's kind of like people start to get antsy. Yeah, yeah, me too. I I I try to do what seventy five minutes when I f- perform my live concerts at the most. Yeah, and uh, and that's plenty. That's like right on the money, right there. You know. Yeah, you leave them, leave them almost wanting more. Yeah, exactly. Well, man, that's uh. It's been great having you on, man. You've been a fantastic guest. Yeah, it's been great chatting with you. And, uh, yeah, so you got uh, JonathanCarrant.com. That's me. At JonathanCarrant on all social media. Yeah. And you have a new single coming out. Yeah, Holiday Song. We took that really annoying uh, Mariah Carey song. Oh, did you do the... Let's see here. I think I have that pulled <laughs> too. People love that song uh, like crazy. It's a pretty good... Is this one right here? Yeah. Yeah. I don't care about the presents underneath the Christmas tree. I don't want to hang my stocking there upon the fire. That's right. So you got a whole Christmas album coming out or just a single? Just a single. Maybe next year I'll do a, a whole holiday thing. Okay. Yeah, the holiday album is so really well, too. Like, yeah. You can even, even Jews love, stuff love like a that. holiday album. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of stuff will get you on all kinds of random uh, Spotify playlists and everything. Like, it's like, doesn't matter who's singing it as long as they're singing your favorite Christmas song. Yeah, well, I knew this year I was only going to do one. So I kind of went between that one and Donny Hathaway's uh, This Christmas. Okay. Um, but I looked this song up, All I Want for Christmas is You, and it had never, it had been recorded, you know, quite a bit, but it had never been recorded in a jazz style. So I thought, oh, well, let's be the first to swing it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm digging that. I'm digging that a lot. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for coming on the podcast. And how about I play us off with uh, your new single here, I'd Rather Go Blind, which you All can right. get on, uh, what, any, iTunes, any anything, right? Amazon. Platform. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Well, yeah, this has been another episode of To the Fullest. Uh, push the button. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jonathan. Something told me it was over When I saw you and that boy talking Something deep down in my soul said cry, cry When I saw you and that boy walking down And I would rather I would rather go blind Than to see you walk away from me that I don't want to watch you leave me Most of all I just don't want to be free I was just just a sitting here thinking about your kiss and your warm embrace Oh, and the reflection in the glass that I, I held up to my lips, babe Revealed the tears, the tears coming down my face To see you walk away, see you walk away from me, yes I would.
Reflection in the glass that I held up to my lips now, babe, revealed the tears, the tears pouring down my face. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my podcast. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here. We are a new podcast every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time.